Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. What a fantastic day in the kingdom. A day in which we get to read another Neville Goddard lecture. This one, it is within you. Given on December 3rd, 1965. And here, as he's done in only a couple other lectures, he tells the story of Abdullah, the one that you've seen memed many times in Neville Goddard groups, where he talks about going to Barbados. And Abdullah tells him, you're already in Barbados. Well, this is the actual story that that is referring to, amongst other things. Tonight's talk is it is within you. We are told in scripture that the Pharisees asked him, when is the kingdom of God coming? He answered them and said, The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor shall they say, Lo, here it is, or there, for the kingdom of God is within you. Luke 17, 20. It's translated in the Bible in the midst of you, but the footnote tells us the literal meaning of the Greek phrase is within you. So when you come across that phrase throughout the New Testament, change it back to within you. All the difference in the world when he took the little child and then put it in the midst of them, it is within you. That's where he put it. He took a little child and put it within them. Taking the little child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child receives me, and who receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Mark 9.36 This will prove eventually to every person in the world to be literally true. It will come with the most, I would say, dramatic suddenness. So much so, you have no time to observe its appearance. It's coming. It just comes so suddenly upon you. That story is told in the 17th of Luke. Well, tonight I want you to believe that this statement within you is literally true. The whole drama is taking place within you, in your own wonderful human imagination. All that you behold, though it appears without, it is within in your imagination of which this world of mortality is but a shadow. Just a shadow, Blake, and all the pipe dreams of imagination, but all of them. The most simple little thing in the world are really enduring essence of things that were themselves the passing dream. I'll show you what I mean. In 1933, looking at your faces, many of you didn't experience it. You were too young. 1933, we went through the most frightful depression in this land. 17 million unemployed, every one a breadwinner. We didn't have 190 odd million people. We had 120 odd million people. But you take 17 million workers, all breadwinners, from that workforce out of a maximum number of people of 120 million, that includes children and the aged and those who could not work for numberless reasons. What an enormous number. Well, in 1933, I'd been in this country 11 years. Like the other 17 million, I was unemployed and I did not have a nickel. But I mean that literally. People will say, well, I didn't have any money. But he has a thousand in the bank. I don't mean that. I mean, I had nothing absolutely nothing living in a basement on 75th street in new york city not knowing where the next meal was coming from but one thing i knew i wanted was to remain in america i came here in 22 and i never wanted to leave unless i knew i could get back yes i went off to canada for a few months but i always came back went to england for four months i always got back if i ever had a nightmare it was that I had a dream where I was in some other part of the world and could not return to America. It was my one consuming desire to live in America. My parents came to America that year in 1933 and spent a few months. I saw them daily. Every day they would pressure me to go back with them to the little island of Barbados and get three good square meals a day and have no problem with rent, no problem with clothes, no problem, period. He had his business and I'm his son. I could enter the business with my family, but it did not interest me. I went to the boat the day they sailed, and for the first time in 11 years, a peculiar feeling possessed me. As I waved goodbye and the boat pulled down the Hudson River, I had the feeling I would like to go to Barbados just on a visit. I had just said goodbye to them and said at the very last moment, no, I'm not going to Barbados. Yet strangely enough, as they pulled out, it possessed me. I would like to go to Barbados. I didn't have a nickel and they offered me a ticket and I refused it. Here I am now with a desire to go and no possibility of going. 
I went to my old friend, Abdullah. I told him how I felt. He said, you really want to go to Barbados? I said, yes, I'd love to go, but I could never go there. He said, what am I teaching you? You can never go. Do you listen to what I'm talking about? Everything is possible to God, and God is your own wonderful human imagination. That's God. Can't you imagine you were in Barbados? I said, yes. Well, right now, this very moment, I'm stopping in his home on 72nd Street, right off Central Park West. He said to me, you are in Barbados. No future tense. The present, you are in Barbados. Well, that seemed the height of insanity. I'm in Barbados. The tallest building is three stories, and that's an outstanding building. All the others are little tiny buildings, no sidewalks. All little narrow streets, and here I'm on 72nd Street, a very wide street, buildings running up 35 to 40 stories into the air, and I'm in Barbados. He said to me, tonight, when you go to bed, you are sleeping in Barbados. You view the world from Barbados. You see it as you would see it. Were you in Barbados? All right, App. To the best of my ability, I'll do it. This was late October, the very day my parents sailed. November went through one day like the other day. No work, no possibility of a job, no money, little food, and, well, nothing. When it came towards the end of November, I thought I'd better approach App, so I approached him. I said, Abdullah, I'm no nearer to going to Barbados than the day I saw you. He said to me, Who is discussing going to Barbados? You are in Barbados. That's when he stopped me. I'm in Barbados. He couldn't discuss it. The first time I tried to bring it up, he not only stopped me and told me I'm in Barbados, but he turned his back on me and walked right back to his studio and slammed the door. Well, if you knew Abdullah, that was no invitation to follow him. So the door was slammed against me. On the morning of the fourth day of December, no reason to rise early makes the day longer, and so I looked under my door was a letter. I got up and got the letter. It was from Barbados. I opened the letter and a little paper trickled to the floor. It was a bank draft for a very small amount, $50. And then the letter, this was my brother Victor writing. He said, I'm not asking you to come. You must come. We are a large family, 10 children and parents. We have never been together at Christmas dinner, never since we are a family. John was born after Cecil and left for British Guyana. By the time he came back, you and Lawrence were gone. Lawrence to college in Canada and you to America. So one was always away when Christmas came around and you never have returned in 11 years. I know you can't get a job for I know you are not working. You have no money. So I have notified the boat in New York City, the A-line to issue you a ticket for Barbados sailing on the 6th of December. Use the bar. If you drink, it's a British ship. Prohibition was, in those days, Mr. Roosevelt had not yet brought it to an end. He did the very end of the year of 33, but this was still early December. He said, use the bar, use it, and sign all the chits. I'll meet the ship ten days after you sail, and I'll pay all expenses. I'll take care of the stewards, take care of all expenses that you might have incurred during the trip. The little $50 is simply to get maybe shirts and shoes and what you need. If you come home, we'll fit you up completely with everything that you need. So I went down to the boat. The man said to me, yes, we have a confirmation of this letter. We have a cable from your family in Barbados. We have a passage going third. We have no accommodations for the first class. You can use the facilities of the first class from morning to night but you have to sleep third class. When the ship hits St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands, we have two couples disembarking and you may take a first class passage from St. Thomas on. I said, thank you very much. I'll take it. After having secured the passage, even though I'm going to sleep third and go first class, all the other facilities like dining, using the decks and whatnot, I went to Abdullah and I said, Ab, this came this morning and I'm going to Barbados now, but I'm going third class sleeping in first class accommodations looked me in the eye. He said, Neville, you are in Barbados. You went to Barbados first class. You are in Barbados. And you went first class. Again, I'm leaving this place for three months and he's just as cold as a fish. Turns the door on me and out I went. It sailed at noon on Wednesday, the 6th of December. I went down, the man taking the tickets. The government 
man taking the passports and checking all those things. So the man who was taking the ticket said, I've got good news for you, Mr. Goddard. We have a cancellation and you're going first class. But you have to share the cabin with two other gentlemen. They're elderly gentlemen and you can take the upper bunk and they can take the two lower. You're going first class, but you'll have to share it with two other gentlemen. I thanked him. I didn't even have time to go phone and call Ab to tell him I'm going first. Then Ab said to me, as I, the last time he saw me when he said, you are in Barbados and you went first. He said, by the way, you say you're going to Barbados. You're in Barbados and you died. I said, I'm in Barbados and I died. Yes, you are in Barbados and you died. You'll understand what I'm talking about when I see you next. You died in Barbados. So that was it. Where did that drama originate? He asked me to do what I did. I walked the streets of New York City, assuming that there were little tiny dirt streets practically and no sidewalks. These towering buildings. And they are, in my imagination, little tiny buildings. All the tropical odors, tropical fruit, tropical vegetables, tropical everything. All the odors of the tropics as you get them in Barbados. And I'm bathing myself in this emotion. My brother, 2,000 miles away, gets the bright idea to send for me and makes it so that I can't say no or didn't say no. Did I influence him? Did he influence me? His letter came after I assumed that I am in Barbados. He could not have preceded me with it. And so I, 2,000 miles away, across water, influenced him to feel I must be there for Christmas. No more missing links. He isn't working and he can come. He has no excuses. So here, I tell you, the kingdom of God is within you. Luke 17, 21. All that you behold, though it appears without, is within in your imagination, of which this world of mortality is but a shadow, Blake. That man's imagination manifests itself in the imaginations of men. My assumed controlled state manifested itself in the imagination of my brother. He thought he originated it. He thought he initiated it and sat down and wrote me that letter, sent off a small draft, made it possible for me to go. As far as the dying goes, Ab was right 100%. When I got on that boat, I was celibate. With a disastrous first union and separated, I felt soured against anything relative of marriage. And so I was celibate 100%. I didn't smoke. I didn't drink. I didn't eat meat. I didn't eat fish. I didn't eat fowl. In fact, I did nothing. And that's why my old friend Abdullah said, Neville, you are so good, you are good for nothing. That's what he meant. I would go home and die to all those prohibitions that I placed upon myself. I was in Barbados three months, still filled with these don'ts. Got on the boat to come north, ten days at sea, and in ten days at sea, I died to everything I had not done in seven years. Here, 1933. I'm now turning the calendar year into 1934 when I came back. So the old man taught me a lesson. You know what you want? Is it clear in your mind's eye? Would you know what it would like to be if realized? How would you see the world? Were you now in that dream state completely realized? It's all objective. Let the world try to trace the effect to a visible cause. Let them do it if they will. The cause is always hidden. You never see the cause because it's always an imaginal state as we are told in John. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world knew him not. 110. Is there in this room one fully awake to the point where you know causation? You see the whole vast world unfolding and it seems to be unfolding out there, but you remember that you imagined, therefore you aren't surprised when the things have begun to happen. And it appears to be happening out there. You know exactly what you did and you can trace the effect to its cause, and its cause is always invisible. If you really believe that all you behold, though it appears without, it is within, you are master of your fate. If you really believe it and live it by it. If you don't believe it, you are tossed from pillar to post, believing that there are causes outside of self, and they can control you. If you don't, you give them the power, which they don't possess anyway. But if you give them that power, well, then they'll take it and you'll believe and prove to your own satisfaction that you weren't the cause of your misfortune or your fortune. It simply happened. 
Maybe you'll trace it to some kind of person or some generous relative or something else and it all adds up to your success and you give all the credit to the events as they unfold before you when the whole thing is within you as you are imagining. So the whole vast world is contained within man. One single man. So Blake said, all things acting on earth are seen in the bright sculptures of lost halls and every age renews its powers from these works. Or where are lost halls? All within your imagination. Every conceivable situation in the world is already worked out. All you have to do is occupy it. What would it be like were it true? How would I see the world were it true that my dream has been realized? How would I see it? Well then, occupy it. The minute you occupy it, you activate it, and it starts moving towards the screen of space, drawing everyone in the world to play the part they must play in order for it to fulfill itself. If you can be used, they'll use you without your consent because you are within the eye of the beholder. So everything is within the man as he imagines. And no matter where that being is that can play the part, even if it's 2,000 miles away, as it was in my own case, to this day, I can never persuade my brother that he had no choice in the matter. I wanted to go to Barbados, and I lived in Barbados, and luckily for me, I had a marvelous teacher who didn't sympathize with me. No sympathy. So when I said to Ab, I have no money, and the time is running by, and I really wanted to go, not just to go to Barbados, strangely enough, I wanted to get there before Christmas. Well, here, it is now almost December, and the man wouldn't discuss it. He wouldn't talk to me. How can I discuss how I'm going to go to a place where I am? So he said, Be still and know that I am God. Psalms 46.10 If man is still and knows that he himself is God, his own imagination, his I amness, well, if God is in man, what else could you put there? Does he not contain the all? He said, This is my name forever, and by this name I'll be known throughout all generations. Exodus 3.14 What's the name? Say I am sent you, that's all. No other name, just say I am. Well, when I sit down and I'm still enough to believe that I am he, I'm told the fundamental sin is man's lack of faith in believing that I am he. Man will not believe that he is where he wants to be because reason denies it, his senses deny it. He would like to be elsewhere, but he feels he can't afford it, or maybe he can't afford the time. He can't afford something, so he feels his reason dictates the fact he is where his senses tell him he is. Really, he's where he is in imagination. If this very night you slept in imagination as though you were sleeping in the flesh, you will discover that in a way you do not know, you will move across a series of events that leads from where you are to where you are imagining that you are. No power in the world can stop you from making it. Across this bridge of incidents, you will go, compelled by the imaginal state which you dared to assume. My boy went through Guadalcanal. He joined the Marines at the age of 17. Years later, he said to me quite innocently one day, you know, strangely enough, when I was simply a little tot looking over pictures, the natives of Guadalcanal intrigued because they were painted with bleached hair, jet black hair in the roots and jet black hair maybe an inch from the root of the head, but beyond all that, the hair was bleached. It was yellow. It so intrigued me, I was dreaming of going to Guadalcanal. So he goes there for a war. Now it seems crazy, but there is no accident in this world, none whatsoever. You can trace it back, if you have a good memory, trace it back to the hidden, unseen, imaginal cause. So when I make this statement, all that you behold, though it appears without, it is within. I mean it. So then we open the Bible, the book of books, and it tells us it's not going to come by observation for the kingdom of God is within. And I know from experience that the entire book is true. Down to the little child, it tells you, if you receive me, you receive not me, but him who sent me. The next dramatic state is the fulfillment of that last passage. You receive him who sent me. When you receive the babe, by the way, the word translated child isn't child at all, it's an infant. Look it up in your concordance and you will see it means a little new infant, all wrapped in its swaddling clothes. It also means a term of endearment, and it is a term of endearment because when you do take it in your arms, as he said, 
He who takes him in his arms receives me. You do take him in your arms and you do speak endearingly to this infant wrapped in swaddling clothes. Now he tells us, you don't receive me, you receive him who sent me. The very next stage is here you go and receive something different. Then who sent him? God the Father. Well, how could I receive God the Father? Wait until it happens. It happens so suddenly when God the Father gives himself to you. How could God give himself to me? I'll show how he gives himself to everyone in this world. God is a father. The world doesn't know it. You read it in the Bible, but do they believe it? God is a father and he only has one begotten son. Thou art my son today. I have begotten thee. It is not said to anyone in the world, but David in the second Psalm, the seventh verse, thou art my son. Today I have begotten thee. So this second dramatic episode, when it takes possession of you, here you stand and you're looking at your son, not as a companion, your son. And who is it? It's David, not a David, the David of biblical fame. This beautiful, eternal being, about 12, 13 years old. He knows you are his father and you know he is your son. Well, how else could God give me himself other than to give me his son as my son? If his son is my son, then who am I? If you are the father of David, and you are, but you don't know it yet. I know I am the father of David, then are you and I not one? I don't care who you are in this world. If you are the father of my son, and I am the father of that son, then you and I are one. Then we understand what Paul means, all are one person in Christ Jesus. We read that in Galatians, all are one person in Christ Jesus, 328. How could all be one person? One person without the loss of individuality. One person without any loss of identity. And yet I am fused with the being who is the father of David. Fusion with him. I have equality with him and yet I have it in diversity. This whole vast world isn't going to change identities. It all will be one person and all the father of David. All wrapped in that one simple little statement in the 17th of Luke. When is it going to happen? It's not going to come as you think. It's not going to come with signs as you observe. If anyone should say, Lo, here he is. Don't believe it. There it is. Don't believe it, for the kingdom of God is within you. Now we're told God took eternity and put it into the mind of man, yet so that man cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Ecclesiastes 3.11 Only in the end will it unfold. And you'll understand what was done in the beginning. It was all in the beginning placed in the mind of man. If you took all the generations of men, all the experiences, and fused them into one grand whole, this concentrated time into which all generations were fused, and from which all sprang, the ancients called eternity. He took everything and put it in the mind of one man, you. Everything is contained within you. Then you go through selecting or not selecting, but playing parts anyway. Most of them are horrible parts because we don't become discriminators and we fall unwittingly into horrible states, good, bad, or indifferent. We fall into them rather than selecting. But at the end, having played all the parts, then the scene breaks and it breaks in such a sudden, dramatic manner that you haven't any time to observe it. It simply breaks, and the whole thing unfolds within you. Where else could you do it? If someone saw you and the time is unfolding within you, they would say he's asleep. To them, you are simply taking a nap. You are asleep. And yet something is unfolding in you that is in all. And the whole drama of Scripture is unfolding within you. At that moment, you have broken the spell and you depart from this age. Not through death. You left it. You're in the world but are not of it. Just waiting patiently for that moment in time when you do leave the world and take this garment off for the last time. What else could these words mean? For I know that Christ being raised from the dead will not die again. Romans 6, 9. Death no longer has dominion over you. Well, if you read that, would it not simply imply... If he isn't raised from the dead, he dies again? If only as he's raised from the dead, would he not die again? If he's raised from the dead, then he's the risen Christ. So that which is not yet 
the risen Christ has to continue to die, and that which is not yet the risen Christ is the life in every child born of woman. Man's own wonderful human imagination is the only Christ in the world, the only God in the world, but he is asleep in man. The day will come suddenly he will awake, and as he awakes he rises from the dead. Rising from the dead he dies no more. But in that dream of his, that long, long dream of 6,000 years, he died and died and died. It doesn't make sense. But I'm telling you things that I have experienced, sitting in a chair, lying on the couch, lying on the bed, and looking with my eyes shut. And suddenly I'm seeing what I ought not to see. I am seeing a world just like this, three-dimensional and real and solid. And my curiosity gets the better of me. I step into that world to explore it. And the world closes upon me. This world is shut out. I have no way of knowing how to get back. There's no road leading to it, but none whatsoever. You step into the world that you are contemplating, and the world is solid just like this, and people just as we are, dressed as we are. Here, you know exactly what happened, how it started. It started in your imagination. You saw it. Where else did it start? Lying on the bed, I should see a bureau and a couple pictures and a door leading into a closet, but I'm not seeing that. I'm seeing the interior of a plush hotel. I stepped into it and came back, stepped into it and came back. After a dozen or more times experimenting, I decided to go explore, come what may. If I never return, all right, I'll try it anyway. So I'm stepping into a world. Did I not die to this world? A doctor in San Francisco told me, well, Neville, I have seen in 10% of the autopsy cases, there's no physical cause of death. Having heard your story, I now know what happened to them. They stepped into these worlds too and didn't know how to get back. There's no physical cause of death. Had I come into the room seeing you in trance as it were, I would have taken your pulse. I wouldn't have felt any. I would have given you all the tests and I would have pronounced you dead as 10% of these have been pronounced dead. They are completely cataleptic as you were. You came back because you remembered. You remembered something that happened to you years before and how the secret of feeling was the secret that brought you back. So I'm standing in this place watching these women, telling them the whole thing is a dream. I saw them go by and I said, ladies, this is a dream. I tried to explain what I meant because I did start it that way. I knew the place where I was in Beverly Hills. I knew the room. I knew the bed. I knew every little object on the wall. I knew everything and I shut it out. And there's no way now to get it back. And I shut it out. And if I'm here in this section of time, knowing the streets of this city, I could go from street to street and get myself back home. But here, there is no street leading back to this section of time and I'm shut out. But I remember that feeling was the secret. And then standing in a hallway, beautifully lit, I felt a pillow. I imagined myself feeling a pillow. After a little while, I could feel the pillow. And here I am, cataleptic on my bed. Couldn't move an nth part. Couldn't open my eyes. Couldn't move my hands. Could do nothing. I am dead. I'm inside this body, I'm alive, but this thing is dead. Maybe a half minute or so, I could push the little finger. In a little while, the elbow could move. Then I pushed it out and felt the warmth of my wife's body. Then I knew I was back. It took tremendous effort to get the lids open. And there were the familiar objects on the wall, and I returned all through feeling. For there was no road back, but I could feel myself on a bed. So instead of standing perpendicular, I felt myself in a horizontal position, and then the pillow and I returned. So if you remember what I tell you, you should be curious, and of the nature that I am, always exploring, and you find yourself out. Feeling gets you back. You'll come on back if you feel an object within the familiar room where you know you left that body. But the whole thing took place within me, didn't it? Well, if my wife woke at that morning and saw me and tried to wake me, she would say, what's happened to Neville? Maybe he's fainted. If she felt the body, it would be cold. She might have been concerned, even called a doctor. Luckily, she didn't wake. She simply didn't know of this experience of mine until I told her the next day. But here is an actual experience. But she didn't see the body. Man identifies the reality of the being with the body that he wears. Therefore, she, identifying me with my body, would have said Neville is dead. 
not the garment that he wears is cold and apparently is dead. She would have said Neville is dead because she identifies me with the garment that I wear as the world does. And you are not that at all. You are an infinite being. God became you that you may become God in the most literal sense in the world so all things are contained within your imagination. So tonight, test it. Cost you nothing. Doesn't cost you one penny to try it. A lady wrote me today, she's in the audience tonight, and she told me this wonderful story. How she went home, and she made this test, one in the office, and she took this test of listening as though the phone rang and the one she is very, very much in love with was calling. But she said, he rarely calls the office. The phone rang, and who is it? He's on the wire. She simply believed that the next call is going to be this one, and she tried it. Then she thanked me for restoring her faith. Well, I hope she doesn't feel that's restoration of faith. Keep on trying it. Keep on practicing morning, noon, and night. You and I have multiple desires, not only for ourselves, but for our friends and others. Well, try it and see if imagining doesn't create reality. The imagining does create reality because imagining is God in action, and God is the only actor the only creator in the world. So as you imagine, you are creating. But if you don't remember what you have imagined, you are going to deny your own harvest. When you see it, you are going to recognize your own imaginal act made visible and you'll even deny them and say, no, I didn't do this. But I tell you, there's no fiction in this world, none whatsoever. We read the most horrible stories in the world. If we have a good memory or we were research artists, We could go back and trace some unknown book, this horror that has just taken place in the world, where a man sits down to bat out a story for a dollar and the more horrible he makes it, the quicker it will sell. And maybe he gets more money. He's boiling his pot, writing all these stories and there is no fiction. While he's doing it, he's drawing the whole vast world into his cauldron to play these parts that he is imagining. He doesn't feel guilty. He doesn't feel responsible for the accident. Do you ever read the story? It's, well, maybe no one knew it until this man, Lord, dug it up, but the book was written in 1898. It never sold the first issue. It was a complete failure. But in 1912, the contents of that book became visible in the sinking of the Titanic. Everything he said in that book of his, which was called Futility, actually was replayed on Earth in the disaster of the Titanic. He even called his ship the Titan, had the same dimensions of the Titanic. He sank it in the same way. He sank it in the Atlantic Ocean on an iceberg on a cold April night. This went down on an April night in the Atlantic carrying with it this enormous crowd of wealthy people. That's exactly what he did with his boat. He had some feeling towards wealth. He had filled his boat, the Titan, with wealthy, complacent people and then sank them, drowning them all. And so 14 years later, it it hatched out. But no one knew that back 14 years before, some unknown author wrote a book, which he called Futility, and gave in detail the story of the disaster that was the Titanic that followed 14 years later. There isn't a thing in this world, good, bad, or indifferent, that you can't trace to an imaginal act. Not everyone has the capacity to write a book to tell it, even in a simple form, but you don't have to put it down in a written form to have done it. All you need to do is imagine it. If you imagine it and accept it as fact and live with it, Though you may not see it come to pass, it's coming to pass. All these are eggs hatching out. One day, in the silence, you ask, what's it all about? What is this whole vast world all about? And from the depths of your soul comes a voice, and the voice uses this simple little phrase, for hatching. That's all that it's for. It's for hatching. You made the egg just for hatching. So you form it in your mind's eye and see it clearly and pursue that vision and don't waver. You form the egg. You occupy it. The world is only for hatching, so it hatches out everything that man is imagining. Good, bad, or indifferent. So today, you and I can become extremely selective and single out all noble states, lovely states, and the world will hatch it out. You and I need not go about devising the ways and the means. They are contained in the state that we have imagined. So you find eventually, and the Bible teaches it, that this world is imaginal. It's not physical. The whole vast world is imaginal. He tells us by interpreting for us the law of Moses. You heard it said, so and so, but I say if you look at someone lustfully, you've done the act. 
They tell you, you've committed the act of adultery if the physical act, but no, it's not the physical act. The act was performed when you imagined it. That's what we're told in the book of Matthew 5.28. He doesn't wait for any physical confirmation. The act was set at the moment when you imagined it. Well, it puts one on one's guard if this is true, and you become extremely discreet and discriminating and selective in all that you do. You become watchful. So in the course of a day, you watch and some unlovely thing passes through and you simply put it aside. You can ridicule it, that addles it, but you yourself will not become a victim of it if you simply don't entertain it. So all that is taking place in the world, someone has set up in motion by imagining. Even if it's nothing more than a man making a fortune, making implements of war, you say to him, how's business? Marvelous. He doesn't care about the consequences of his act. Business is great. If someone came in here this very moment and didn't tell me his profession and he said, Neville, will you accept a request a prayer? And I said, yes. Well, would you hear that my business has increased enormously and that I really have to open other areas? Well, without asking him, what is your business suppose? I said, well, I will hear that your business is just thriving. And after I've committed myself, he tells me I'm a mortician. If he's a mortician, doesn't he want business? You can't stay in business unless people die. So he's a mortician. After I have said yes, I'll hear, you've got wonderful business and this is going to be a big year for you. Well, you think it over. All these things in our world. So he may be your father, your brother, your sister who has such a shop. I don't know. They are essential in this world of Caesar. Believing as man believes, having been taught these strange, peculiar things about death, while we still believe these superstitions, morticians are still in order. Suppose now someone is in some other kind of business, a horrible business. He doesn't tell you, but he wants increased business and you know how to pray and you simply make a picture of the man and he tells you that things are flowing beautifully. Everything is perfect and you learn afterwards the nature of his business. But here you become selective, become discreet and single out all the lovely noble things of the world and plant them in your mind's eye. The world is for hatching. It will hatch out everything in this world. So when I use that title, it is within you. I mean it. I mean it literally. You don't have to ask anyone in this world to help. Not one person. Sit down quietly and when you begin to imagine, know that it is God in action and all things are possible to God. That man is all imagination and God is man and exists in us and we in him the eternal body of man is the imagination and that is God himself. He actually became man. He isn't pretending that he's man. He didn't disguise himself as man. He emptied himself completely and took upon himself the limitations and the weaknesses of man who is all imagination. Philippians 2.7 Then as man he makes all the mistakes in the world until that moment in time when he awakes deliberately in the man in whom he sunk himself. So he rises, but as he rises, we arise with him. Individually, no loss of identity, he completely gave himself to us and does not ask us to give up our individuality when he rises in us. So when he rises in us, we rise in him. We are one. We aren't two. That's the wonderful statement in Paul's letter when he makes the statement that he who is united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. 1 Corinthians 6.17 these aren't two anymore. He cleaves to you. He so loves you, he cleaves to you until you fuse and become one. And in that one, it is you. No loss of identity. You enter this fabulous world in which we live. And here we find unity and equality and diversity, the whole vast world. No one losing identity, no one losing individuality and yet one. There's that wonderful statement that reveals the unity, which is the son of God. When he stands before you, and he will, you know who he is. Isn't that the strangest thing? In 1965, the book tells me he lived a thousand BC. As a man called Neville, I never hoped that I would ever in eternity meet the characters of scripture. You meet them all and you were before them all. Everyone you preceded because you are God. They all come after. They don't come before. Nothing comes before Christ. Nothing. They say, BC, before Christ, there is no before Christ. Everything in this world comes after God. So all these characters that you see in scripture, well, he said, Abraham, surely he preceded me. 
it was 2000 years BC that's what we're taught and here I am 1965 AD how could I ever meet him and the day comes and you do meet him all within you the whole drama takes place within you and you were before he is so you know the words before Abraham was I am John 8 5 8 and when the world shall cease to be I am so you proceed everything to look at David this heavenly being of 13 years old and in no doubt your mind as to who he is here is this well you can't describe the beauty infinite beauty you can't paint him you couldn't put it in the form of marble he's too beautiful he's beyond all description and he's your son you know he's your son and he knows he's your son then you find the word in scripture no one knows who the son is except the father and no one knows who the father is except the son and anyone to whom the son chooses to reveal him matthew eleven twenty seven. for at that moment in time he has no choice he has to reveal you as god the father or you receive the infant and he who receives one such child receives me and he who receives me receives not me but him who sent me well who sent you god the father so when you receive this when you receive the one who sent him well how will i know i received him what will he look like wait and see no one will know the father but the son so when the son appears he looks right into your eyes and then for the first time in eternity memory returns and you know who you are you don't have to look into a mirror you don't have to look into the past or in the future this present moment the son reveals who you are it takes the son to reveal the father and the father the son then you meet others in this room tonight sits a gentleman friend of mine who's had this experience he's had the three great experiences only now patiently waiting for the fourth one so he's had the three in the same chronological order that i've told you since it happened to me in the identical order in the same interval of space or interval of time between it takes nine months for the first three to unfold then another two years and nine months for the fourth and final one to unfold then you are at the end of the journey so he only has to wait another two years plus for the dove at the end of these lectures neville would give two minutes of silence followed by questions and answers now let us go into the silence Are there any questions, please? Question, Neville. One thing I haven't understood at all, if that were the first act of God when you were speaking of the sign of the birth of the infinite, does it then follow that one would not be able to leave this garment at that time until those four were completed, or could he exit this garment and pick up the other three? 
Neville says, if I read my scripture correctly, you will not depart until the dove because he has to be a witness to the word of God. He said, remain in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. Luke 24, 49. Well, the power from on high is the dove. Messiah's tremendous power laden work begins at the descent of the dove. So you remain in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. Then you'll be my witnesses. Acts 1, 8. Beginning with Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, we are called upon to witness the truth of God's word. The only purpose for this journey is simply to well experience scripture. The whole thing was told that man has to experience it in the depths of his soul. All that is said of Jesus Christ in the scripture, every child born of woman is going to play. But he plays it not to the eyes of mortal man. He plays it in the depths of his soul, but everything. So at the end of the dove, how soon after, I don't know. I've had the experience. I've had that since the first day of January 1963, and yet it's almost 1966. Question, well, what I was asking Neville is, in this particular earth, the first act would have happened here. Would I not be able to exit this until all four had been completed? Neville says, well, that's what I said. I don't think you will. That's my interpretation of scripture, because man must know the truth of scripture. You can't find it by rationalizing it. It's not something that is of human composition. All the churches of the world try to make reason out of the Bible. You can't do it. It isn't intended for secular history. It's sacred history. So he tells us in the book of Acts, they want to know when he said, it's not for you to know the time or the season the Father has fixed by his own authority, but wait until you receive the power from on high. Well, that descent of the dove is the power where the work is completed and the seal of approval is put upon you. Then you can depart. But in the meanwhile, you could no more remain silent about it than you could stop breathing and expect to remain in this world. As told us in Jeremiah, if I say, I will not mention it or speak any more in his name, then there is, as it were, in my heart, a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. I must proclaim to my brethren what happened to me. I'm not saying they're going to accept it. You will accept it and you will come here because of your intense interest. But among my, say, intimate circle of family, not one accepted it. Not one. Well, that's fulfillment of scripture. The seventh chapter of the book of John, verse five, and his brothers did not believe him. So I have eight brothers. There are nine boys and a sister. They look at me as well. You see, I don't have the money that they have. They all have money. To them, success is money. Now they have to fork up what they've been keeping for me all these years and so it's quite a considerable sum of money but they don't consider that my money because my father gave it to me i haven't earned it they feel that they've earned their money therefore they are a huge success in the world of caesar for they have earned money and i have inherited money just as good bank takes both so that's the world in which they live but they have no confidence in my mystical experiences and this ends it is within you by Neville Goddard. This covers a lot of the same ground that we've covered in a couple of different lectures. I always find it hilarious that Neville does make sure to mention that he had been celibate. So obviously, Neville gets lucky on the boat, which is interesting. And obviously, he does some drinking and some smoking on the boat because he implies that he breaks all those and he eats some meat. As he changes who he is, it goes beyond. And we get a different discussion of this in the lecture, One Greater Than John, where he compares the state that he was in to being in the state of John, where he didn't drink, didn't smoke, and do any of those things. A couple of other interesting things that came out of this lecture. For instance, the idea when you imagine for someone else to be successful, sometimes the job that they have could mean that you're causing some sort of disadvantage to others. You imagine somebody that sells weapons to be successful, then there's going to be war. When a war happens, he can sell his weapons. When you imagine a mortician to be successful, that might mean more death. I talk about this when I talk about the large sums of money mindset. I imagine that money is coming to people in the best interests of all, with the free will of all. I imagine that money is coming in perfect harmony with the good things of life for people. So I've tried to do that a little bit. I've tried to amend how I imagine for others so that it's in the best interest of all, that it's a good thing, it is positive. But even then, it's a part of the imagining process. There's a lot here that you can pull out of this 
that you can use to apply to your imagination that we get a little bit more detail. Neville's talking about going to sleep in Barbados, but he also goes on. It's just not when he's going to sleep. He walks around in Barbados. And remember, he is in New York with all these tall skyscrapers, but he's imagining small buildings with no sidewalk, walking in the dirt, because that's Barbados. So he's really, really imagining playing make-believe like we did when we were kids, walking around, and it's not insane, but he has to suspend his own belief in the world around him to a point where he believes that he's walking on dirt and looking at three-story wide buildings and he's in Barbados. He smells it. He feels it. That's what we're talking about when we imagine. And for many people that struggle, Brian, why is it not working for me? You're not imagining. You're still stuck in the world that you're in now. You have to go that extra step and walk around in the present moment in the reality that you want. If you want to be a billionaire, you walk around as a billionaire all the time, thinking thoughts of a billionaire, feeling feelings of a billionaire, whatever state it is that you want to enter. It's not just you falling asleep with it or thinking about it in a short meditation. It is assuming that it's happening now. That's the key. It's constant imagination. And then you begin to experience the bridge of incidents that he discusses. Everything that you want is not out there somewhere. The key, it is within you. All the states, all the things are within you. And we are all one. What a beautiful way for him to describe it. He always describes it just a little bit different. The other interesting story that I don't remember hearing before, he maybe mentioned it, we have so many lectures we've gone over, is the story of his son going to Guadalcanal after having an imagined as a boy being in Guadalcanal and he ends up going through war. There's always a sort of subtle implication there that when you're imagining, be careful what you imagine. You might imagine that you want to go to Guadalcanal, but you'll end up going in war. So you want to be specific with your imaginings. Imagine going to Guadalcanal in a happy time. Be careful what you think, for it will come. There is no fiction it is within you you can find all episodes of the reality revolution at therealityrevolution.com check out my art at newearth.art Access these images to help you find true prosperity, large sums of money, true love, radiant health and spiritual enlightenment with unique portals into the new earth. Welcome to the Reality Revolution.